being at Triangle all those years, I would just be around nothing but Atlanta producers. So you'd see Nash B, DJ Spins, you'd see Pierre Bourne, and you're just watching them make beats. TM88, Fuse, Southside, Metro, literally every day. DY, all those future sessions we would be a part of. Eventually, you just realize, like, why don't you just take the kick if it's lackluster, put it in FL, you know, pre-computed effects, or just turn it way up. They call me and they're like, yo, Ye is in town. Do you want to track for him? He needs an engineer. I had just left the gym. It was the morning. I was playing basketball or something. I thought about it. And I was like, nah, 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 I don't. Then I took another shot, probably airball. And then I thought about it again. And I was like, <laughs> it's like, if I say no to this, I'm going to regret this forever. So I called him back. I was like, all right, bro, I'll do it. Preston Prizzy Reed is a Grammy award-winning mix engineer. He's mixed for artists like Money Long and Omale, and was an engineer on many major projects such as Donda. In today's video, take a look at how Prizzy went from an intern to a Grammy award-winning mix engineer, and some killer tips he has for mixing hip hop, pop, and R&B at the highest level. Before we get the video started, if you wanna learn more about Prizzy, check out the course he did with My Audio Academy. In that video, he does a deep dive into his Pro Tools session. I kinda wanna start from the beginning of your career i believe you had an internship at silent sound studios so with that i feel like it was kind of a divine intervention so my cousin actually was one of the head engineers at 12 studios in atlanta and he was always like man cuz you gotta you gotta come down to atlanta you'd love it here blah 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 i didn't believe him at first i was in chicago at the time and uh yeah, he would convince me to, to come down and I'd spend a few days here and there, you know, out here and doing tracking sessions and stuff like that. And one time I was in the studio with him and I was recording. I don't even know who I was recording. And an old friend of his from Full Sail just came to visit him. Uh, her name was Melissa Weiss. And, you know, they talked in the hallway and he was like, oh, man, this is my little cousin. He's super dope. You need to know him. He's looking for a job. He needs a job. And, uh, you know, I was in the room. I walked out, met her. You know, we had a brief conversation. And she was like, yeah, sorry, we don't really have anything available. And eventually she was like, well, I run a studio up the street. It's a small, you know, not too crazy studio. And, uh, yeah, it turned out to be silent sound. She was telling me that they weren't really hiring at the time, but she maybe can get me a meeting with the owner. So one time I was out here and I missed my flight, everything. I just kind of put faith on the line. I missed my flight back to Chicago. I had no money. I stayed in some hood hotel by the airport. You know, I didn't even sleep under the covers. I was just like in my clothes on top of the covers. And I Ubered to this small studio I saw the plaques and saw the SSL and met TK and the rest was history. Sound Sound Studios, yeah. you, did you kind of climb the ladder there? Yeah, I remember just trying to take everybody's shift. You know, people would find reasons to take off. And I would, every time, just try to, oh, I'll come in on Saturday. I'll come in on Sunday. I'll come in on Monday. I'll come in any day just so I can try to be valuable. And, you know, you make your mistakes as an intern. You have hiccups and you mess up some things, but... I think just being around and showing that you're reliable can really, you know, put you on people's radar. How did you distinguish yourself from other interns at the studio? I used to do this thing, uh, toilet paper origami. So, you know, the thing you'd see in like a hotel, you go in the bathroom and the toilet paper would have like a dove or some type of a, like accordion flower looking thing. It's like a three minute YouTube tutorial, but it's just the little things that you know, say you were the intern and people eventually start to realize like, man, every time George is here, this place is abnormally clean and the bathroom is abnormally nice when he's here. And eventually, you know, those things start to resonate in people's minds. So yeah, you said you interned for a year and then after that, did you move to like uh, an assistant after that assistant engineer? Yeah. So just for a brief bit, um, kind of assisting and things like that at silent and um i kind of hit a fork in the road because i didn't know what i wanted to do part of me was also going to just go back to chicago and you know take some time to figure it out but ultimately i ended up kind of landing a spot with tricky stewart at triangle sound which wasn't 
far from there. It was essentially down the street. I met a friend who's, you know, basically one of my best friends now, Jeremy Brown, also through Melissa. She, she was kind of like a guardian angel in a way, like inadvertently, but she introduced me to him. And I was just looking for a new opportunity. I would call him, he would curve me. I would call him again, he would curve me. Eventually we found time to link up and he was transitioning out of the role of being Tricky's like assistant and engineer. He was trying to do his own thing as a producer. So it was a great time, you know, it was just perfect timing. And I came in and immediately kind of got inserted into that system. Let's kind of get into those years of working under him. When you first started, you said you were in a, were you just an assistant to him? You weren't doing any engineering? Absolutely not. I knew his coffee and loaded songs on his iPod. I used to put gas in his car, like everything you could think of. Like I was that. And then eventually he trusted with a little more and a little more and a little more until eventually you're in the chair. So when you were working under him, do you have any, like, I guess, interesting or kind of crazy stories of things that would happen during sessions? Oh, man. Every day was psycho. Every single day. It's crazy. Um, I don't think there was a dull moment. And at that time, I was basically living at the studio. Like, I kept a pillow in my car. Like, I would just... I was there so much that it didn't really make sense to go home a lot of the time. And if I did, I would just go home, sleep, shower, make some eggs and go back to the studio, you know? Um, but yeah, every day was, I mean, Tricky's a big deal. He's always been a big deal as long as I've known him. So one room would be whatever artist you can think of, they'd be in the A room. Then another artist would be in the B room, C room. And when you're, Tricky's guy, not just working for the studio. It's really your responsibility to facilitate every room. So maybe, I don't know, Metro Boomer would blow the Augsburgers in the B room. So you have to know the amps well enough to be able to reset them and fast enough to not throw the vibe off. Because if the vibe is thrown off, they leave, everything goes bad. And it all reflects on you because you're a direct representation of Tricky. Is there anything else you were kind of doing during that time as assistant as well, like engineering wise? Yeah, so I was recording demo sessions. So I would record uh, Sickpin, who's a great friend of mine. Shout out Sickpin, um, K Major. I would record so many people, just room in every single room. Uh, maybe me, Jeremy would still be up there, my boy Will, Richard, Sam, of course. Like there'd be so many of us just trying to create something for the internal team. But then also he'd be renting some of the rooms out to other clients. So we had to switch gears like pretty regularly. Almost every night we had to switch gears. Were there any like lessons you learned, really valuable lessons working under like just a fantastic producer, like Tricky? Too many lessons. Um, first one being you can't get too technical. Obviously as an engineer, you want to, you know, we get caught up in the ones and zeros, but you always got to remember that it's a song and not a science project. And it's like, you know, working with Tricky, working with Kook, working with, you know, Dream, all of those people, they they explain themselves in musical terms. So if you start talking about, all oh, the kick need more 160 or 60 hertz or 80 hertz, like, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's just like, no, it don't make me feel the way I want to feel. It's not right. And you have to under you have to figure out what that means musically. So I mean, you learn a lot of that working under any you know great producer. You learn the philosophy. Yeah. So when you started recording, what were some of the first artists you recorded with? Was there like a first major credit you got while recording artists with him? Mm. Yeah. I mean, it was a lot of people. I'm trying to remember how it even started. It just kind of just moments kind of happened. You know, I used to work under Sam Thomas, who was like an older brother to me. And he was, you know, manning the ship for the most part on the, the bigger sessions. But there'd be times where he just couldn't do it. And I'd be in the other room and maybe I would record, I don't know, part of Alessia Cara's second verse or things like that. You know, and you have those oh shit moments in the middle of the session. You're like, oh shit, this is this person in the booth. 
but you have a job to do. So then you kind of, you know, snap out of it and get back to work, you know? So from that point, there was like a pretty interesting credit during that time, I believe, that I wanted to ask you about. And it was for The Voice, which Tricky was working on, I believe, a Brooke Simpson songs. Was that like the first mix you did for Tricky or under Tricky at that point? Um, At the time I was mixing, I was just trying to weasel my way into mixing, like at all times. You know, I would ask, I'd just get no after no after no after no. And you just let it roll off your shoulder after a certain point. But that was a rare yes at that time. Um, I guess they got a call. It was, I remember it was past midnight when they got the call. So it was from LA. And I think it was kind of facilitated through Miley Cyrus. And they said they needed a mix. Tricky was like, all right, well, you mix. You're not that good, but you mix. Can you do it? I was like, yes, absolutely. Please, please send it, send it. So I did it. The mix was, in hindsight, it came out all right. But yeah, I mean, they needed it. I think I was saved by the bell because they needed it immediately. So I don't know if they had enough time to evaluate the quality of it. It just had to come out. So it did. And you know, I was credited for it. And uh, yeah. Speaking of like trying to transition into, into mixing, were you like really going hard on these rough mixes that when you were tracking, like, did you have the opportunity to do these rough mixes? And where you're like really trying to go to make them sound as good as possible? Bro, I mixed those records like I had a gun to my head at all times. <laughs> to me, that was my eight mile moment because I knew it was going to be played for, you know, Tricky and everybody I looked up to. I mean, obviously Tricky and Jason were, you know, they've been best friends forever, essentially, as far as I'm concerned. So I knew if it was good, he'd play it for people that I respected. If it was trash, then I'd just get disregarded. So every rough mix counted. Like I mixed it as if it was, you know, going to get nominated for a Grammy. Um, but that really helped move the needle at that time. Like looking back on it. Did you ever have moments like when the record came out that you say you had like a Jason mix on the record where you could take your mix and compare it to like the Jason mix and where they're like, was that like a method you use to learn, you know, what am I doing differently here? Oh, yeah. All the time. All the time. Every time, you know, something I would record or somebody in the building would record something. The phrase every day was, oh, yeah, this is great. Send it to Jason. And I would be frustrated. You know, mind you, I was 24, 25, 26 or whatever. And um, I just wanted to mix. And I thought I was better than I was. And then we'd send it out and it'd come back and the low wind would be so crazy. The song would be way louder. The vocals would be way crispier. Just everything was way better. Um, and although it's a blow to the ego, it kind of gave me a blueprint to like kind of dissect, all right, what is actually happening here? And I could compare what I did versus what he did. And this was year after year, mix after mix, just kind of reversed engineering a lot of things and it's really good ear training you talk about doing these rough mixes super quickly how did kind of those those instincts of just pushing up the faders as fast as possible like one guy i follow ken lewis he always talks about this oh, thing called guy. sprint mixing which oh, is yeah. like you got i think 10 minutes you gotta you know just make the mix as quick as possible so how did kind of those quick reactions translate to your mixes nowadays First of all, shout out Ken Lewis. He's been a mentor of mine for a very long time. Love that guy. Um, yeah, I mean, I think as a mixer, you kind of learn how to switch gears. As a tracking engineer, it's a really good practice to do those sprint mixes, which is kind of like an end of night. The artist just needs to take something home, so you got to just make it sound as good as you can because there's only an hour left before the session is over. But that's very 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 good practice because it forces you to focus on what actually matters if you have all the time in the world sometimes you end up you know notching out things in a some random percussion thing that doesn't even matter in the song whereas if you have an hour you focus on the main thing um so i think it is really important to figure out like what is the star of the show and what is the supporting cast? Like, what is Diana Ross? What is the Supremes? Diana Ross is what people came to see. The Supremes just support Diana Ross in this in a mix. 
Um, so hope that answered your question. But yeah. that's what I try to think of when I'm mixing, especially when I'm racing against the clock. No, yeah, that's a. I think that's an extremely valuable skill, and it's like sometimes I think it might, you know, it's better to have like two hours to mix a thing rather than two years, because people just, especially when they're starting out, um, just tend to can, you know, you can so easily overthink a record and just pick everything to pieces. I think what was that? There's that story about was it Billy Jean that had like the '97 oh yeah mix oh, revisions yeah. and then and they went with like the second one yeah it went with the like second that. one no it's easy to get caught up in like the ones and zeros and you know you start second guessing yourself and thinking twice on eh, is this one better oh this can come up a little bit but you're starting to lose the feeling it may sound better but you're selling a feeling essentially like nobody cares to know how you did it if they don't feel the song did you ever leave tricky stewart when did you decide to kind of leave that camp um on. i left at the beginning of 2018 no yeah the end of 2018 sorry 2019 ish and by then it, it, relatively speaking it happened pretty fast so i was working with him by day i was doing tracking sessions by night there and then every minute in between i was mixing and trying to I mean, it's Atlanta. There's so much talent. And if you have a skill, you know, you find different people or they find you and they ask, can you mix it? And at the time, you know, thankfully, I had kind of a full time situation. So I was so busy with, you know, Tricky and that camp that I had a little bit of leeway to mix stuff for free. So that's exactly what I did. I would find producers and be like, yo, you're fire. We need to work. And they'd be like, oh, I don't have any money. I didn't ask that. <laughs> Send me the session. And eventually you do that with so many people in town that, you know, the dots kind of start to connect themselves. So by the end of 2019, maybe, or the end of 2018, 2019, I felt like I had kind of gained enough clients to at least try to step out on my own. And it wasn't easy. I fell flat on my face for sure. Like, I was down bad, eating noodles every day you know, that type of life, but it slowly picked up traction, you know, and here we are. So when you were first kind of getting those initial clients, was it people through the studio that you knew or were you like also just DMing like tons of people just trying to find? Yeah, it was a little bit of all of that put together. Thankfully, there's only seven days in a week. So in my mind, at least back then was all right, I just need seven clients every week. I just need seven songs. That's it. I could commit to that. And it was hard to have like a set rate because every situation was different and I was very much in like a hustling phase. I just wanted to stay active and stay sharp and more so send out a ripple effect that I'm here to kind of plant my flag as I'm a mixer, not just the, the tracking guy, not just the guy that brought you coffee last time you saw me and that was it's hard to make that transition but i was at least trying to be as tactical as i could at that time to make it obvious that you know we're in a slightly different name tag this time so i wanted yeah. to ask about like one credit i guess during that time and that was donda how did you come about working on that record by then i was already mixing full time this was 2021, yeah. And I was mixing full-time. I had, I wouldn't call it success, but I was, you know, it's my full-time thing. And I, I was able to, you know, kind of handle myself just mixing solely. So by then I would have been like a year and a half removed from tracking anything. Um, mind you, when you're mixing, the hardest thing is saying no. When you need the money, but you also don't want to, only be the tracking guy. So I had to spend a good year and a half just telling everybody no, even though I needed the money. Um, so with the Kanye stuff I was mixing and Jeremy and Andrew, shout out Andrew Fuller, they called me and they're like, yo, Ye is in town. Do you want to track for him? He needs an engineer. I think I was like, I had just left the gym. It was the morning. I was playing basketball or something. I thought about it. And I was like, nah, 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 I don't. Then I 
took another shot, probably air both, and then I thought about it again, and I was like, <laughs> it's like, if I say no to this, I'm going to regret this forever. So I called him back. I was like, all right, bro, I'll do it. And I'm, I'm glad I did. But I got to be honest, I was extremely nervous because I hadn't recorded anything in like a year and a half, two years. So imagine your first gig back and it's Kanye in a stadium. Like, it was like not boxing for a long time. And your first fight back, you got to fight Canelo. It's like, this could go really bad. But it, it worked. I still still got it. Still have my chops. And uh, yeah, it, it, all, it all worked out. Yeah, that's like a crazy call to get, you know. It seems like you you're in this routine mixing records. Yeah. You know, you you're at the gym just kind of chilling out and suddenly you get a text which is like essentially kind of life altering in some ways. It's like, well, do you step up to the plate and yeah, it's cool yeah. that you know, you kind of overcame the nerves and that's got to be like sort of a, a one of the more nerve-wracking gigs doing. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but it was a sure. good teaching tool too. Like I got to be honest, like just for all the listeners and stuff like that, like or followers and watchers, I think it's easy in hindsight to look at something or someone and be like, oh man, they they just do whatever and they're not scared or whatever. Not true. I was terrified, like if I'm being honest, but you could still feel whatever you're feeling and do it anyways. And that's at that time, exactly what I did. It's like, probably was had jitters all the way to the stadium and I got there but you can still persevere through that and there's usually a big reward on the other side of something that makes you really nervous like that um so for what it's worth for anybody who you know maybe feeling that in their own life or they get that big call and they wonder if they can do it and they also have that eight mile moment and they throw up mom spaghetti and shit in the bathroom <laughs> before they do it like you know, you could still push through all of those feelings and do a great job. Yeah. So how long were you there at the stadium? Did you sleep there? Did, did that kind of consume your entire yeah. life for yeah. that portion it, that you were there? It definitely did. I didn't sleep there just because thankfully I lived like 10 minutes away from the stadium. <laughs> thankfully. But I mean, but, you know, my boy Dawson and... You know, Rourke was up there. There was a handful of people up there that that was their life. You saw them and they had bags under their eyes. Like it was, it was rough. Um, but yeah, that was the hardest part was kind of tapping back into that schedule. Because as a mixer, you can't get very comfortable. You have your own regiment. It, it's based off of uh, completion as a mixer. It's like having just, it's like having homework and you get it done in a certain time and you're good. But when you're tracking, you're on somebody else's time. So when they say, can you come in? Like, whatever you're doing, drop it. You got to go. So that was a challenge to kind of get back on that schedule, you know, working until sun up to sun up again, going home, get a few hours of sleep and do it all over again. It was it was tough, but it was all hands on deck. You know, he might walk in the room. It was sci high. It was push. It was all these people. And it's like people were just scrambling. You know, somebody would have a new idea and then everybody's scrambling again in a different way. So that's how it was up there. But the first day I brought up, I brought everything. Man, I brought I brought way too much. I brought speakers. I had this big like rolling cart with a Mac Pro, whole rack of gear. I was just prepared for war. But by day three, I think I just brought an Apollo. It was like, yeah, they don't. They don't care about all this stuff. <laughs> Apollo and a C800 is fine. And I want to kind of fast forward to 2022, I believe, and where you mixed the new Money Long album, right? Public yeah. displays of affection, the album, hours and hours, and obviously congratulations, you uh, won the, the Grammy for hours and hours, I believe, right? Yeah, thanks, bro. So yeah, that's awesome. But how did you uh, end up working with Money Long? How did you get those mixes? Um, so I actually started working with her, ironically, like a couple weeks after the Kanye stuff wrapped up. So I was back home and I was 
one, she's trying to recover on sleep. And um, I got a call from Dre Davis. And just said, yeah, I got this artist. She's a writer. You met her before a couple of years back. Um, but she's doing her artist thing now. It's all independent. But are you interested? And at the time, I was it, honestly almost didn't answer the call. I think I was like in the bathroom. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So I answered on like the fifth ring and we talked and I was just like, yeah, yeah, just, just send the songs, just send it. I don't think we even talked about rate that much in that conversation. And he sent me some roughs and I was like, yo, this is fire. And after that, it just, to me, the rate didn't matter. It was like, man, whatever we got to do, I just want to be a part of it. Um, and that's exactly how it worked. We did one song and she liked it. Then she called me not too long after that and said we're working on the ep i'm sending you the sessions and i mean i'm just happy to be a part of that like i feel like that was her her moment it was inevitable in my opinion and i'm just happy i got to help you know bring it to life yeah that's awesome i I think as you said you know not focusing like entirely on the money and just seeing this big opportunity and just you know, going with it, yeah, taking it. Um, yeah. And cl- yeah, it clearly it worked out uh, pretty well. And that song, Hours and Hours, is, you know, huge now. It's super impressive. And, you know, and, and she was uh, independent as well, which is, oh, yeah. Yeah. which is really cool. Now, on that album more specifically, I was reading an Instagram post you did about it, and you talked about reinventing your mixing style, like, I believe the prior year, like, I think you posted in the post like 2022 and then in, I guess, 2021, you were kind of reinventing your mixing style, you said, and focused more on simplicity, it seems. So can you sort of talk about that change? Yeah. So I think years ago, I used to essentially just emulate everybody I looked up to. Uh, One of the main ones being Serban, Manny, Jason, you know, all the, probably everybody that gets emulated, but And I would just do what they did, like it was a recipe, like a cookbook, like, oh, this is how you do your drums. This is how you do this. This is how you do your mix bus. And it worked, but there was always a part of it that felt like I was just cloning and not just being myself and how I actually hear songs. So I do think at the start of your career, you should find a North Star and follow it to the T. But at some point you do have to break free and find your own sound. while also still incorporating all of those things, you know, when it's needed. And that's the money long stuff was the first time I opened the session and I didn't impose my will. I didn't say like, oh, well, I have a lavery, so it needs to go through a lavery. I have summing, so it needs to go through summing. I have this, so it needs to go through that. I just pressed play and took a step back. And was like, yo, the magic is here. All I gotta do is like compliment it, but it's already there. I didn't use any outboard gear. It was all in the box. And I just followed my ear and how I felt about the song. And it worked. And because it worked, I haven't looked back. You know, I still have gear, don't get me wrong, but I use it as needed at this point. It's not like standard practice anymore. Yeah, that's fantastic to hear. You kind of just, uh, yeah, I I think it's just so easy to get like, I don't want to say distracted. And I think it's important to learn from like, when you're kind of starting out, learn some of these techniques that Serb and Jason and Manny are doing. But I also think it's important to kind of take those techniques and workflows and kind of understanding kind of the theory behind them and then taking that theory and applying it to your own kind of taste. And there's a a, kind of like a Dave Vinsato quote, it's like, I'd rather be different than good. So I think it's important to tap into your own sound and uh, not get distracted by what other you know mixers are doing or other techniques that you see online i mean it's it's basquiat you know you got to learn the rules like a pro and then you break them like an artist right you have to go through that gauntlet of like this is the right way to eq this is the right way to this you got to filter this you got to roll this off you got to do this you got to learn luffs you got to learn all of these things just to finally get to a point and say i'm going to choose to just go right and i know i can do this but I want to do this because it feels good to me and that becomes your sound um and then 
things change, you know, because then people want to hire you for you and how you sound and how you hear records and not just the budget version of the person you're emulating. Now I wanted to kind of talk about some, I guess, some more uh, specific uh, maybe techniques that you do and, and stuff like that and, and kind of tap into your taste as like a mixer. And one thing that I think really stands out about your mixes is you have these like really just smooth and, and just great sounding like R&B vocals. So do you have any tips for kind of getting that sound? Do you have like a, you know, a go-to like vocal chain that you use? I have a template for sure. Um, I don't use everything in it. It's all like kind of interactive and just like within reach if it's needed. But I will say something I use almost every time is the UAD Pooltech EQ. And that idea I got from Dexter Simmons. I had a long conversation with him some years back and we became like friends. And I would, and I would call him and just be such a nerd about it. Like, you got to tell me what you did with those Brandy vocals, please. Like, I'll give you my kidney. And he told me, okay, you know, and, um, but he didn't give me like a specific setting. He didn't say like, oh, you got to do it with this, with this, or on this thing. No, he just said pull tech and just left it alone. So it kind of forced me to kind of do a deep dive on what the hell is he talking about and why did he say that? But over time, one, if you just engage it, it kind of saturates the vocal in general. Two, you could add low end to it. Three, you could add some smooth top end. Um, and then everything else is the basics. You know, you got Fab Filter, you have maybe Rvox as needed, make DSP 404, all the usual suspects. But it's not really the what, it's more so the how and the why. Um, but I do try to keep the sibilance low unless the song calls for it. Some songs actually just sound cooler with sibilance out <laughs> enough. Um, and then I try to surround the vocal with a really good verb, um, a lot of pre-delay, just things that kind of hug the vocal. Um, that's it. It's more of a philosophy than like a recipe. Yeah. That's awesome that you, um, mentioned Dexter because I just joined like this, uh, mixing discord called the mix collective and Dexter's actually yeah. on there and he's like r really active. He's like, he was, a uh, Showing everyone like the H3000 tracks oh, yeah. and stuff no, he's like the guy. that. The 101, program 101 on that he used on yeah. like, I guess, all these uh, like, you know, R&B backing vocals. And he used the yeah. Dolby Type A, like, oh, yeah. high end stuff. Yeah, he was dropping some oh, songs yeah. on there. <laughs> well, um, he's, he's the guy. Yeah, he's the GOAT for sure. <laughs> um, Now, another thing I want to ask about, I, I know you just mentioned having like, reverbs and stuff like that and different effects. I, I I hear like a lot of different throws in in your mixes. So how do you go about kind of crafting those throws um, tastefully? I think that's kind of a uh, something that a lot of people when they're starting out like mixers, they'll hear throws on the record, like a, a big mm -hmm. record and they'll try to emulate them. And it just sounds like not appropriate for that for that time. So how did you kind of build that taste? Yeah. Um, overdoing it. I think anything you learn that's new, you probably overdo it first. And you learn how to dial it back to taste. And I used to do, again, like years ago, I would emulate Jason. And I'd be like, wow, is this delay going behind your head? So we'd always do like Mad Scientist Sundays at the studio. Be me, Slice, and Richard. And we would show up on Sundays when wasn't much going on. And we would, we would just go all out and just practice delay throws. It was kind of like a sparring session. Um, so yeah, you just kind of learn the philosophy of putting stuff out of phase, rolling things off, putting stuff through a reverb, flangers, all this stuff, and like how to do it and when to do it. But I think now I could dial them in pretty fast, but I will tell you a tip. If you solo the sides in the mix, so say you open up like metric AB or something and just solo the sides. So do your delay throw and bring it down the taste when you only hear the sides of the record. And it'll tell you if it's too loud. You'll hear it immediately on headphones or if it's too like boomy or muddy because you'll hear the frequency masking with other stuff. So that's usually how I can dial in stuff like that appropriately and I don't have to like look back. I could just do it, leave it, move on. Yeah, it's a killer tip for mixing some, uh, some good throws and 
yeah, I think it's important to kind of listen to different throws by different mixers and try to emulate those. And that's, that's mm -hmm. sick that y'all had that. Uh, I forgot what you said, but something about like coming and everyone mad comes in the studio. Sundays. Yeah, mad yeah, scientists Yeah, you gotta bring Sunday. that back. Yeah. yeah back. <laughs> Over philosophy, it was like, yeah, it was it was crazy. We had to do that all day. We'd cook some food, make some burgers, and just study records and try to emulate stuff. Like, if you come to Atlanta, man, we gotta we gotta have another one of those. Yeah, <laughs> let's do It'd it for nice. sure. Moving on from that, do you have a philosophy for mixing low end? I know some people like some mixers like to go crazy on it. Like Jason has like all the side chaining stuff, the saturate all the tons of saturation. Um, yeah, like versus a Manny who might not even touch the low end at all just carve it a bit so what's your kind of uh take on on low end i think i've spent so many years trying to copy these guys like once upon a time that i'm somewhere in the middle of those two extremes you know um in most cases i try to leave it as is especially in atlanta you got so many producers that they're they're drum doctors you know like if you get a a beat from dj spins if you get a beat from Southside. It's like, or even, you know, OG Parker or whatever, like, I'm not going to touch your low end for you. You spent the whole day dialing this in, you know, I'll build around it to highlight it. Um, but then you get stuff that's a little lackluster from others, you know, just, you know, random producers or even producers that they're working in a smaller room and it may sound cool, but it doesn't have impact. Um, then I'll do things to beef it up. So it's program dependent. I don't really have like a set rule. Um, but pull tech is good for that too. I will say on low end pull tech. Uh, yeah. Good gain stage. Do you do a lot of like parallel splits, like on an 808, like you might parallel part, distort it, kind of spread it in some way or do you I'll do that if I hear a problem, if it's kind of boring and just like a pure sine wave, I'll do something to kind of make it pop out of a small speaker. I might parallel it. I might split it up. I might use like Clev Grand Gaffle. I might use Wave Studio Rack. I might use just some straight up, you know, decapitator type of thing. I might do the old school 808 growl thing, you know, the Ibanez yeah, joint. Ibanez. Like I might, Yeah. these are all weapons, right? Like, and when you go into war, you want as many weapons available as possible so you can, you know, react accordingly so i think learning all of these techniques is super important yeah and and one thing i, I did kind of have a question about was how do you kind of learn you know you got all these different techniques that you might see for mixing 808s and stuff but how, how do you kind of develop that ear to know like when to use uh like each technique or a different type of distortion did that take a while for you to develop yeah, but I think just listening to music, I think you know a lot more than you think you do. If you listen to music a lot, you may hear something and you may not know where you're trying to go, but you know what you like and you know what hits the check, bar the check marks in your brain. Um, so just doing it, just mixing a lot. Every mix gets better, right? Your first mix is going to suck. Your second mix is going to suck a little less. Eventually, you get, you know, 500, 1,000 mixes in, and somebody says, all right, you're, you're pretty good. Um, but you're learning along the way. Experiment, make those mistakes. If you hear it, try it. Worst they can do is say no. And even if it's not no, for, even if it's a no for that record, it might be appropriate down the line for another person's record. So always keep that in the back of your mind if you do something cool. Yeah, I think experimentation and just trial and error, that's like, that's key to learning these things and uh, developing an ear and like a taste for when to deploy this certain like technique or something like that. Now, yeah. another thing I wanted to ask about was, do you have like a, any sort of, I guess, gain staging process when you're mixing? Like, I know you mentioned you had a template, but do you have, um, I guess, sort of a way to like organize things? Do you do like tons of different subgroups and and different things yeah like so that. i have um i have all vocals all vocal effects all music all drums i'm debating if i should do it all bass because sometimes you can get in trouble with the drum bus and if 808 is going to or a sub bass and it's not yeah sometimes you can get in trouble with that um but i checked my mix bus i checked my meters 
and you could just hear when something's a little too pushed. And if it is, maybe I'll highlight everything and just click it down just a bit to give me a little more room to play with. Um, but I try to use the gain staging that was given to me, unless it's just like trash. If it's trash, then I got to do my own thing. But I'll definitely try to start where somebody else left off, um, level wise. Um, you mentioned like having the drum bus and the bass bus. Are you what sorts of processing are you doing to the drums as a whole? Like, will you start the mix with like, say, like uh, saturation or something on the drum bus, or do you kind of add it as you go along? Best case scenario, I use nothing. But if the song needs it, then I have to beef it up accordingly. Um, and it depends on the type of song too. I like to say I want the kick to be bigger. Best case scenario, you just attack the kick. You just focus on making the kick bigger and nothing else gets touched. Um, but in some cases, you do need to treat all the drums as a whole. So to answer your question, there is usually nothing on my drum bus. If it is, it might be an EQ. Might be every now and then I'll use standard clip if the rough has really, really, really heavy drums. Sometimes I've even taken the drums, which is a, a pro tip, which I, I don't think I've ever told anybody this, but I'll take the drums, take the stems, put them in FL Studio myself and use like pre-computed effects, beef them up to make them hit like FL Studio does and then re-export it and put it back in the session. Just because it's like, I mean, FL is a new NPC. It has a sound to it. Like, why would I spend four hours trying to recreate something that you have the program to on your computer? That's a pretty crazy tip. I know there's a lot of mixers who try to emulate like, the FL Studio knock that you get from it. What kind of adjustments are you making in FL? Like, are you just hitting that limiter? I think that was like the, was that what kind of gave it its sound? The, the like default I think it's limiter just of its the, own? Or just... I think it's just the architecture. It's just the engine, the 32-bit float engine so i take the limiter off like i mind you being at triangle all those years i would just be around nothing but atlanta producers yeah so you'd see nash b dj spins you'd see pierre born like all these people all the time and you're just watching them make beats tm88 fuse Southside, metro literally every day dy all those future sessions we would be a part of and you just watch them make beats you're just sitting in the back of the room and Eventually, you just realize, like, why don't you just take the kick if it's lackluster, put it in FL, and just, you know, pre-computed effects, or just turn it way up and let FL clip it on its own. Just rebounce it and trim it to taste in Pro Tools again. And there's the knock right there. Like, it's like a two-minute process at best. Yeah, that's definitely something I got to try. That's the, that, that's a, it's a cool, uh, cool technique. I mean... It's the new Lavery, man. It, it has its color. It has the sound. Everybody has it. Like, why not? Yeah. So speaking of like beats, I'm sure you get two tracks to mix a lot. And I kind of did a poll um, on my YouTube to see like different questions that people would want to know about. Um, but a lot of people are really like want to know how do you mix a two track beat to like a, a vocal? Yeah, so there's one song that people ask me about, and I don't really, I don't know if I tell many people, but this Money Long song called Time Machine. That was a two-track. And um, yeah, it came in and it wasn't really hitting, in my opinion. I still don't think it hits. I don't know if it's a great mix. I just think people like it. But yeah, it was a two-track. I think I added a pull tech at the bottom of it. I carved out a little bit of the mid-range. Sometimes if it needs it, I'll do surgery. I'll split it up into certain bands. I might use ozone or isotope master rebalance. Just turn the drums up, turn the bass up, turn whatever's missing up. Like there's so many creative ways to, you know, beef up something or make it pop out, but you just got to be able to hear it. Um, so I think having a good monitoring environment is really important or good headphones that you trust and just, you know, kind of identify what's missing try to come up with a solution to add it in to where it sounds believable and not you know synthetic so that was a good example of it yeah those, i think those are some like super awesome techniques for uh kind of i guess fixing a two track because i'm sure as you know like 
mixing with two tracks sometimes it, it can just be like you know a wild card i mean it's challenging too as a mixer especially as a tracking engineer when you're sending something out and it has your name on it and people are judging it with no context you know they may listen and be like yeah george his mixes ain't hitting like that and you're on the other end like bro this is what was given to me so i think there are a lot of techniques that you can at least try to hit the checkpoints that you would want to hear if you had the stems a lot of it is the low end the snare sometimes you can go on the grid and draw the snare up every single hit there's a handful of things you can do to make a two track come alive now when you talk about going into the grid and drawing the snare up is that with like the pencil tool like going in and like redrawing the yeah the... or make like the grid really fine to the point where you only have like the snare drum hit in that little part of the grid then you just take the draw tool and maybe draw it up 2 dB and then just copy that down the whole beat. So now when you press play, instead of doo, doo, tsh, it's doo, doo, tsh, the snare will come way up and it sounds like it's more impactful. That way you can turn the vocal up a little more so they can kind of live together in the same place. Yeah, that's an awesome tip right there. <laughs> that's a gem. Um, oh, yeah. So moving on, do you have like a mix bus? uh like a go-to mix bus that you use uh do you mix top down at all yeah so i definitely mix top down i pretty much throw my mix bus on like when i start the mix and i'll listen for problems i do have in my template like an og mix bus aux and my mix bus aux so when i open the session say jess sets it up or richard or whoever sets up the session I have their plugins on first in the OG mix bus. So I'm listening to what they have, exactly how they left it. And then I might engage stuff on my mix bus and just toggle and just be honest about it. Sometimes my mix bus is killing it. Sometimes they may have some strange thing going into some other thing that is a part of the production and you just got to run with it. Um, so in my mix bus, I have Crowell at the end. Sometimes I'll use Ozone limiter before that sometimes i use oxford it depends on the song i usually have some type of multi-band but it's been interchangeable as of late so i don't really have an answer for that right now um and an eq that's it's not too crazy you know i try to tackle a lot of it within the mix um and yeah man it's, it's case by case yeah, I think that uh that approach that you mentioned with having the like the multiple different mix buses that's that's like really awesome to see it because I do think kind of the mix bus at this point can be part of um, the the kind of the the pr the production process you know like they if they did their entire song through it and you take that off it's like you're never gonna beat like the rough or make it feel and have the, like the same emotional effect if you don't have that mix bus and some scenarios i mean and it's all about being kind of like water you know like you want to be able to flow into what they gave you and not just impose your will unless you know for a fact this is better and i know what's better but in some cases you might work with the producer or the tracking engineer who's incredible they just need that extra 10 percent. like as a mixer i think you got to understand where if this was football you got to understand where you're starting sometimes you're starting first and goal on a mix. Sometimes you're starting, you know, at the 50 yard line and sometimes you're starting at the other goal and you got to throw a Hail Mary just to make it work. But when you're working with like real pros, they may give you something that is already like incredible. And your job is just to not fumble. Whereas sometimes you have to bulldoze it and kind of say, all right, I'm taking this all the way. Every song is different and you got to identify where you are and where you start in the mix. Yeah, I think that's a, Awesome, like analogy. I'd never thought of thought of it like that before, but I think that's so true. Just sometimes you gotta, you know, you get like, you know, I guess a two track and a probably a recorded vocal and you gotta, you know, do the Hail Mary and uh, yeah. kind of bring it to the yeah. finish line. Or sometimes you get a really well produced and well tracked thing and it's like, don't overthink it. Don't, don't mess it up. Exactly, exactly. And all the clients will change, right? Like if you're mixing a lot of songs throughout the day or the week or whatever, you know, working with somebody like a Tricky, he knows what he wants. He's been doing this probably longer than I've been alive. 
So it's like for me to just bulldoze everything he did, it wouldn't make a lot of sense. But if I'm working with, you know, a 19 year old producer that has great ideas, but maybe not know exactly how to execute it, it's a different job. It's a different hat that I have to wear that day. You know, I might have to roll up my sleeves or I might have to say like, yo, this is the sound. It's a SoundCloud sound. Like I'm not here to turn it into an R&B song. Like this is the vibe. It's supposed to slap. The kick is supposed to be like 20 dB too loud. Cool. I like it. You know, like you got to determine the game plan before you even press play or before you start like digging into stuff. 